Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first session of Charismatic Image with Dayan Mukic. I'll now read a brief description of the class. Charisma is an unavoidable force of aesthetics and politics. It can be viewed as charm in its positive or affirmative version, or as tyrannical manipulation in a will to dominate in its negative form. But the mysterious etymological root takes us back to the ancient Greek word charis, meaning grace or favor. Charisma is therefore a form of a gift, something received from the unknown elsewhere. But how exactly is it attained? Cosmically, divinely, artisanally? And how does it turn from grace into a curse? The seminar looks at charisma in relation to the image in which it is embedded. An image, an object, a line of writing, a situation, or the presence of a person gains the power to inspire and attract at the level of temperaments and barely perceptible impulses. Charisma in this sense is a microclimate, both natural and supernatural. The goal of our weekly investigations will be to usher its movement like that of, of weather phenomena, from a divine gesture to an atmospheric disposition. For even miracles relate to changing atmospheres, solidifying water in order to walk on, on it, reducing gravity in order to levitate, etc. Changing the atmosphere means reformulating the laws, both divine and natural. In a series of four brief encounters, we will try to pinpoint the very instant of creation as such. To this end, we will look into paintings, sculptures, installations, embodiments, and atmospheric phenomena. Dayan Lukic, uh, is a, Lukic, Lukic is a professor at the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts. He's a scholar and writer with vast teaching experience stemming from art schools, liberal arts colleges, and research universities, including Reed College, Rutgers University, the New School, Columbia University, and the School of Visual Arts in New York. His work revolves around the inescapable convergence between art, anthropology, and philosophy. He is the founder of the Vitalist Cuisine and Step Not Beyond projects, which are informed by future pedagogies of creativity. He is currently writing a trilogy titled Emanations that covers themes of charisma, enchantment, nature, light and shadows, and multi-ontologies. So, uh, Dayan, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, always uncomfortable to listen, you know, mm story about yourself uh, read by someone else. I don't know who invented this formality, but it, 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 it's perverse. In any case, good to see you all here. Thanks for, for you know, joining me from whatever corner of the world you're in. Um, I'm in New Mexico, Santa Fe. It's noon here, pretty good time to have a conversation. I know for, for many of you, it's a different time. So I appreciate you being here. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, good. Um, so uh, uh, Jonathan read the description of the course. I mean, what else can I teach you here? What else can I tell you? It's all there. Um, so let me begin maybe by saying how I got to this topic idea. And then uh, also just about the meaning of the terms charisma and image uh, to begin with. And this will be an in introduction. It will constitute an introduction in the following three sessions. We'll you know, probably jump into um, readings uh, directly. But since this is the first one, I think I have to start in this way. So. I've been, you know, studying or researching this this topic for a number of years now, and and uh, it came to me through two or three um, encounters. Uh, number one was when I was in Indiana uh, years ago. There was, a, I think, hundred years birth or death of Gustav Klimt. I forgot. I hope he will forgive me, but. It was a, a big celebrations all over the city and in galleries, they were exhibiting his work, Gustav Klimt. And, you know, I wanted to see the, some of them and um, uh, the most famous one is called The Kiss. It's a big painting 
um, you know, two lovers embracing and kissing. It's now on many posters and so on. Anyway, uh, I went to the gallery, they were exhibiting that and the exhibit was, the painting was encased in, in a thick glass, this thick, okay? Put in the middle of the gallery and there was a, a, a huge line moving slowly like this at serpentine around the painting to see it. I mean, it was madness, it was unbearable. And, you know, I, I don't remember if I've even seen it or uh, done the whole thing or not, but, you know, I went out and, and kind of just, I don't know, uh, sad and I was in the subway and I saw an ad in the subway. It said, Hieronymus Bosch at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. I said, oh my God, there's a painting by Bosch. I've never seen that in my life. There's a few of them and it's here. And so I decided to go there. It turns out that this Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna has its own galleries at the top floor and they have Bosch's triptych, one of Bosch's triptych called The Last Judgment. Um, and uh, the other, the Garden of Earthly Delights is in, in Madrid in Prado Museum. Museum. So I went there and it was absolutely the opposite. There was no one there. You, know, you walk through the galleries. It's just a guard in that gallery. You know, you nod, know, say hello. He says, guten tag. And, you know, you're in front of this painting. And it was really incredible experience for me. First time uh, probably ever that I felt like I was levitating in front of this uh, work. And it was an unusual thing because I like contemporary art. I don't really look at old masters with that seriousness, but it was really, really something special uh, being in front of that uh, work. Um, and that moved me very much. And this is, you know, the, the time when I started to think about, okay, maybe these old theories <laughs> uh, uh, of art where they, you know, speak about the aura uh, in art are true, uh, despite of what contemporary philosophers say. Um, and I'm thinking here in particular of Antonio Negri, uh, who writes that there's no oral energy in art, that that's a, you know, invention in fantasy, and that we shouldn't see it like that. Um, and I respect him very much. But I completely disagree. And I, and I, you know, went through this kind of uh, realized and thought, okay, I, I have to think through this and think how to, you know, maybe argue for oral energy uh, in objects um, without sounding like a total traditionalist and, you know, retrograde, retrograde uh, thinker. <laughs> Uh, so, of course, the question is to, for me, not is there aura and energy in the object or gesture or space or Hey, Gayon. Hey, your audio is missing. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay, you're back. Okay. Did you not hear me for a little bit? Yeah, maybe go back a minute or two. Yeah, we, we, we left it at aura. Okay. Did you hear me that was saying that uh, I want to argue for the oral energy? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I was just saying that and yeah, thank you. Please just notify me if you lose me in sound wise, and I'll repeat um, that what's important is to redefine the terms like aura and energy. So for me, unlike for many other uh, aesthet aestheticians or art philosophers, uh, it's not about discarding that altogether, but rather redefining uh, what these words mean. So providing totally new definitions. Uh, that's not easy. 
uh, because these words and concepts, of course, carry within themselves several centuries of meanings piled up on each other to the point that, you know, they lost meaning. Um, one of the important things, I guess, when we're dealing with uh, such questions is, and um, other philosophical terms, and I would say political terms as well, is to de-theologize them. And this, you know, is something that other, many others have said and are trying to do. Um, so I actually uh, agree with that. Uh, we have to, not have to, but it's advisable to take out the theological uh, significations that permeate these words. Now, when we do take out the theological elements, what is left? What do we have, you know, left? And how do we navigate through that? So I'll, I'm giving you kind of spoiler alerts here as already, but it's okay because these are really, I don't know, new ways of thinking about this. Um, for me, the movement is from the theological to the atmospheric. Um, and I take, you know, both aura and energy to be atmospheric properties. And this is what I mentioned or Jonathan read in the description of the course as well. Even all theological gestures or miracles as we call them already contain atmospheric modalities within them. Okay, so I'm just looking and I'm trying to extract this um, subtle um, power in the particular objects persons, images, and so on, and uh, see what other forms of power are there outside of the predictable, you know, power to dominate, uh, which is also imbued with our understanding of charisma um, currently, probably. So anyway, this was all pro provoked through confrontation or encounter with Bosch's painting. Um, and then a few months later, I was in the bookstore and walking through the through the aisles and there was a book, you know, facing uh, toward the aisle with the title, The Myth of Charisma. And I thought, oh my God, what is this? Someone actually wrote about it. And I looked at it, it was absolutely awful, awful book. Um, written by some person professor i guess who was uh who made it for people who are studying leadership studies in business schools so it is you know it's for future business leaders um how to be charismatic yeah we lost you again Hey, can you hear me? We lost your audio again, Dion. <laughs> it made me a little angry and I thought, okay, I, I need to uh, redo this and rectify this. Um, so that was it, basically those two encounters with the book and with the painting. Um, and then there was another line of a writer that I really love, which is Clarice Lispector, Brazilian writer. Um, that I'm sure some of you have read. Uh, and she has, uh, I mean, tons of lines that would correspond to this that I'm saying, I think. But one in particular, uh, she says, I don't know, I don't remember the details. But it, she says, I'm a novice without a cult. Okay, that's it. This is a short sentence. I am a novice without a cult. And for me, this was precisely this uh this position that i was looking for and thinking about which is extracting the theological element from the what shall i call it phenomenological or maybe even divine experience i don't know but both phenomenological and divine let's let's keep them both there 
uh, but extracting the institutional and theological out. So, you know, this really reinvigorated me just, just, uh, just this line uh, from her. I am a novice without a cult. So what is she saying? Uh, she is a neophyte initiate apprentice, but without the institutional regulatory lawmaking uh, community. So, you know, what kind of power emerges out of that disposition? Um, I guess that was one of the operational questions and, and remains an operational question. So that's the background of you know, how it all started. Now, the, the actual terms themselves, uh, what did they refer to charisma and uh, image? Charisma, as you heard in the description, uh, uh, most nor normally it's translated as charm, presence, uh, allure. But I looked for the etymological root, of course, because it's good to look for etymological roots. They are really rich, uh, much better than lexical definitions. Um, they open up a whole landscape, an entire conceptual landscape, if you will. Uh, and also provide a precision uh, to the word. So the etymological root is, uh, of charisma is charis, it's ancient Greek, uh, meaning favor, gift, grace. Okay, so it's especially divinely conferred talent or a gift. So it's a gift, but it's still tied to this theological divine sphere that I, we are trying to ex extricate ourselves from. So, but as I, as I you know, was digging in deeper um, and looking in deeper, I found more exciting openings as well. As well. There's another definition, which is, you know, harder to find, um, which is, with charis, the same word, the same term, uh, refers to that, that which causes joy or, or pleasure or delight. Now, this really excited me very much. So it's actually uh, the, the root car, car, K-H-A-R, uh, in ancient Greek, that, pre that was a prefix for a number of words uh, indicated things to, that produce well-being, okay? So we have a, now a stra more strange um, opening and a portal uh, of the word, which is on the one hand, of course, referring to grace, huge, difficult, um, philosophical, theological concept with enormous history, but on the other hand, also etymo etymologically referring to some, to very specific, somewhat specific uh, bodily or physical uh, experience, which is joy or pleasure, form of well-being. So this is really um, interesting. I love this, I don't know, paradoxical, uh, situation that's, you know, um, uh, imbued in the term, one being massive uh, metaphysical, if you will, if I can use that word, sense of grace, and then the other totally material and physical experience of joy. So th that's just something to keep in mind. Obviously, I'm thinking about joy also as potentially a political um, concept, uh, therapeutic, of course, um, aesthetic and so on. So an investigation of joy in, in those terms, in terms of ethics, politics, all of that. This stems already from um, Spinoza, um, 17th century philosopher, a number of people who have followed him have pointed that 
out already that Joe should be a political council. So, um, so that's in terms of the, the word itself uh, being a gift, which is something of course, that's not religious. Grace has religious connotations. Um, but also in art, I think it's a question, it's, a, it's an old kind of stereotypical question. Does an artist need a gift uh, to produce something special? The same with the writer. And no matter how much I would like to say no, and no matter how much we hear that in today that no, it's not necessary, the more I think about it, the more I, it feels like, yes, it is a form of gift. It is an element that's, that's necessary uh, for something uh, extraordinary to be produced. Many people disagree with that, of course. Um, I'm thinking here of uh, the writings by Louise Bourgeois, French American artist, and in her, especially her diaries, she has magnificent diaries. Uh, she wrote diaries her entire life. So it's, it spans like 70 years or something insane like that. But um, there's a collection of selected diaries and interviews called Destruction of the Father, Reconstruction of the Father, something like that. But in there, she writes really beautifully and very clearly uh, about the necessity of the gift uh, for an artist. Um, and to me, she's still the most convincing person when it comes to this. So uh, I take that the gift is also a necessary element in the creative production. Now, what constitutes a gift? Is at the core of a gift, a form of grace? What constitutes grace? Maybe we'll be able to, to answer those questions in the coming weeks, but you know, those are difficult, difficult, uh, of course, questions. I don't mean just, you know, to say, hey, it's a gift and that's it. It's not clear what constitutes a gift. It's not clear what constitutes grace um, and but we do see certain expressions, certain modalities, certain modes of being that are constituted in the work, which point towards this grace or gift. Okay, I hope, I hope I'm making sense here. Um, it also reminds me of, uh, uh, something Charles Bukowski said amongst many silly things that he said, but he said something like, writing comes super easy to me. It's like popcorn. The words just pop, 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 pop. I don't even think about it. And he was really cruel, you know, in his kind of assessment of that and saying, if it doesn't come like that to you, don't write. I wouldn't go that far, but there's something in, in, in this, you know, that, and I, I'm sure you experience that when you write or when you, when you draw or whatever, whatever it is that you do. Um, the thought is formed in the process of writing and in the process of doing. Um, it's not there before for the most part. So how does it, you know, how does it pop up? How do these words actually pop up, you know, into a, into a series uh, of thoughts? The, another, another perhaps experience too, that's common. Uh, I experienced it, I'm sure you do too. When you go back to something you have written uh, and you can't recognize it. This is me, I wrote this. Maybe I'm insane, that's a possibility, but I have this experience all the time. Um, 
if something has come out that hasn't been rationalized in my head, it just kind of emanated out of my disposition, I would say, rather than reason. Okay, so anyway, these are of course all speculations we are we're, that we're trying to make uh, concrete and and uh, as clear as possible. Now the term charisma, of course, has a history. Um, it's not super interesting, I think, but uh, anyway, it, it's it's good to know. Like I said, it uh, it ha it was part of theology for a very very long time, um, starting with Saint Paul, at least in the in the Western te so-called Western texts. Um, Saint Paul writes about charisma as a gift from the Holy Spirit, um, and that becomes a doctrine until the fourth century. In the fourth century uh, of Common Era. Uh, Catholic Church uh, forbids this theory and uh, creates a doctrine in which charisma does not come from the Holy Spirit, but from the institution, which is the church. And, you know, so it goes uh, uh, for many, many centuries. It's not really a philosophical concept. Um, until the beginning of 20th century, 1910 to be more precise, Mike, Max Weber picks up the term and secularizes it and uh, starts to write about charismatic leadership in politics as opposed to bureaucratic leadership, okay? So now we start to have, you know, introduction of this term in the political sphere and the political realm. Um, and then, as I mentioned, and as I, as I told you, I think now in the 21st century, it's mostly in management studies. So it just gets worse and worse and worse. So, um, uh, it's, you know, in business schools, now they're teaching this apparently, uh, management programs. And of course, people talk about it for for TV reality personalities and sometimes presidents when they become or move from TV personality. So uh, it, it really, the term and the concept is totally diffused of, it's totally diffused of uh, its power. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking, and I hope, you know, we will be think, uh, able to think of, uh, think of it in these other terms that I was that I was outlining. Um, and the question still, you know, kind of remains of what is the inner working of an object? Uh, what constitutes the power of the gesture? Object, person, image, and so on. So there can be many, many answers to that question. Um, and I, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, uh, answer it, answer it yourself, maybe in, in your assignments. Now, for me, the gesture uh, is that of emanation. I mean, gesture, literally speaking, you know, whatever kind types of gestures there are in, in the world and the phenomenal world. Um, the gesture is one of emanation and, and I'm studying now the obscure philosophical movement uh, that no one looks at now uh, called emanationism. It existed. Uh, Plotinus was one of the first main representatives and then there were some other people in 18th century who, who dealt with it. Um, but it's discarded and, and totally obscure. Um, but I'm having fun with it because I like discarded and obscure things. Um, so gesture of, of the charismatic image uh, would be one of emanation and the signal or the effect is one of plenitude. And this I take from Soryu, Etienne Soryu, whose readings I gave you this term plenitude. Um, uh, 
we'll see if we can define what constitutes plenitude. But for me, this is this is the movement, if you will. Uh, the image or the object or or person carries a gesture of emanation, which signals or which is put into an effect or which puts into an effect a certain type of plenitude, abundance, if you will, fecundity, okay? Let me just see for a second. Okay, I have maybe 10 more minutes uh, of this of this background background story. Um, well, I'll give you a chance to ask maybe a question directly related for to, to this for clarification. You don't have to. There. Oh. You can take it all as yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. I guess I'm just curious about this um, the word plantitude. Like, could you please talk a little bit more about it? Like, are you talking about um, the modes of existence, the things that we were reading about, like those different types of existence that combine into this plantitude? Mm -hmm. or something else yeah just wanted to clarify that yeah thank you alicia uh you know what let's get back to this in the second part uh because then we will just discuss uh, uh things that connect to the readings but uh i will clarify it and i'll just confirm what you said yes i mean it in exactly in those terms and this is what I meant. I, I kind of take this term from uh, Soryu in and I misuse it as well because I think of it in terms of, you know, just as you summarized it, as different modes of existence coming together uh, in this plenitude or plentitude. Um, and I'm trying to understand what he's saying. I'm trying to follow him. I'm trying to study him study him um, and think of this uh, plentitude as something that uh, exceeds existence. So life that, or possibility of life or possibility of experience that surpasses, what shall we call it, regular existence. I think that's what he would also term, uh, uh, what he, how he would describe plenitude as well. And what this term that he uses, the main concept, sur existence or sur existence uh, refer to. It's something that surpasses existence, I think. What is that? That's a difficult question. Hey, Dion, your audio is messing up again. Uh, hey, Dion, you uh, blanked out for a minute there. OK. Um, when I, I think of the plentitude in the same, in, the, in a more um, literal sense as well. so. When, I, when we look at the Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, uh, what I see there is example of plentitude uh, because there's an enormous fecundity at work in the painting, which doesn't really correspond to regular existence. Forgive me now, I'm using, it's kind of silly term, regular existence versus, uh, but, you know, I wouldn't write it in that sense, but right now, <laughs> this is just for our conversation. So uh, what is happening there in the painting, let's say, and also in Sergio's work, uh, it's some kind of a, 
dream. It's some kind of a nightmare, as Berger says too. So it's an imagination of a nightmare or imagination of, uh, of a dream that does surpass existence. In what sense? In some weird collaborations that are happening, for example, in the painting between human and non-human entities, strange transmogrifications of the human into the inhuman. Um, so for me, this is what constitutes literally uh, plenitude. And I would even go further and so you probably would absolutely did hate it and say that I don't understand, but um, I would think of this plenitude also as a form of uh, biodiversity. Now he uses the word diversity. He uses it in terms of, uh, in terms of different modes of existence, uh, but I would use it in terms of uh, biodiversity, especially if we are looking as he does, and I, I, again, I gave you this text just to see um, questions that a philosopher raises that are not really questions that philosophers raise today. Um, and this book was written in 1940, published in 1943, so he wrote it in early 1940s. Uh, Bruno Latour and Isabelle Stenger, very prominent philosophers, did pick it up and wrote a huge introduction, which is in the in the PDF that you have. Um, but the questions he poses are really things no one discusses here, which is also the question of the value and the question of the virtue that is constitutive of this existence which surpasses the the ontic or the regular factual existence so what is that value what is that virtue according to which we could think of plentitude and i use that term in relationship of course to thinking about joy as another form of uh, experience that whose effect is plenitude as well. Um, so what constitutes it, you know, I, I, I would say uh, biodiversity uh, for me should be and is probably the highest virtue um, for, the, for the experience of plenitude and for the, uh, for the experience of this sur existence that he's talking about uh, as well. Now, I'm not saying this has to be the main virtue or value for, for everyone, uh, but what we should think and consider is what, it, what are the hierarchies of values according to which we operate? Uh, this Yeah, I think your audio is cut up again. Operating according to someone's values. Hey, day on your audio disappeared again. Sorry, sorry about that. I don't know why. Um, there's another uh, thing that Sir Leo mentions, but it's also apparent in, in Bosch that I mentioned, which is that Life is a dream, he says. Um, what do we see in Bosch's triptychs? A dream, a utopia, or a nightmare? Uh, Deleuze has a beautiful saying, Gilles Deleuze, a French philosopher, in which he says, the worst thing in the world is to live in someone else's dream. I couldn't agree more. Uh, by extension, the best, the best thing in the world is to live in your own dream. Um, the problem, of course, is we think 
uh, or not maybe we, but people take reality that is outside as a, as a factual objective reality, which it is not. It's been, it's something that's been constructed through, you know, social, economic and metaphysical forces for, for centuries. So what values and virtues constitute this uh, dream that we are living in? Um, I think that's the question. So, you know, uh, don't laugh, don't laugh, please. Uh, but I say this, uh, I, I use the term biodiversity and I just watched the other day, the, the latest David Attenborough film on Netflix. Uh, I forgot the title of it. And he says the same thing. Um, biodiversity is the most important uh, value and virtue. So in that regard, rather than with philosophers, I, I agree with, with uh, David Attenborough. Okay. Leave it at that, okay? And we'll come back to that, uh, uh, Alessia. Um, just quickly to mention that the other term that is in the title, uh, which is that, uh, which is image. Um, image comes also from Latin uh, term or word uh, meaning, the root being imago, meaning imitation, but it also has another, of course, meaning more material and more uh, concrete, which is a term that was used for masks of the dead, that some Romans, this was a, a habit, uh, would create masks of their deceased relatives when they died, and then they would you know, pull them out and they would exhibit these masks in, in their hallways or whatever, wherever. Um, and that was also called imago. So I like this more concrete uh, um, description and definition uh, of the term. It also reminds us that it's a form of fabrication image. It's always a, a form of fabrication. Uh, it's, for, it's a form of artifactualization too. Um, it's a form of hallucination. So rather than imitation, I prefer to think of it in terms of hallucination, but you know, in a positive sense, more a productive, uh, productive uh, sober form of hallucination. Um, so maybe just before we have a little break and then enter into your questions um, and, and comments, I want to show you the, the painting by Bosch and uh, actually two, one is a painting, the other is a website created by some institute in Holland, which allows you to study every single detail of the painting. And there's even a, a voice over and, and music in it. But, um, okay, let me see if I can do this. Okay, uh, do you see this painting? Yes. Okay, thank you. So this is Bosch actually, uh, and the title is uh, Extracting the Stone of Madness. Um, this was a medieval procedure uh, where they believed 
uh, in Europe that madness actually coagulates into a rock, which is in the brain, um, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, there was a surgical procedure uh, through which they would extract this rock by making a hole in the skull or scraping the skull, awful. Uh, but in any case, this is a this is a description. This is a painting that carries that name by Bosch, which also shows the procedure. Now, you can also see that the surgeon has this funnel, and he looks he looks uh, um, ridiculous which I think is exactly the point uh, that Bosch was trying to make. Um, and another thing what really strikes me is that the other text that I gave you, the collection of Ale Alejandra Pizarnik, is titled Extracting the Stone of Madness. Um, in for her prose, prose poems. Now, I would say that, you know, what co constitutes this charismatic uh, modality is at precisely the stone uh, of madness. What Bosch produces in his work, what Alejandra Pizarnik uh, produces in her prose poem um, are precisely these stones, uh, these rocks that have a higher degree of, that produce a higher degree of existence or experience, uh, uh, if you will. So this plenitude that we mentioned and that we talked about actually is dependent on producing or containing uh, this stone of madness. And now look at this really weird and strange thing for Bosch. How does he uh, represent the stone? Well, it's actually not a stone, it's a flower. It's a flower that's been extracted from the head uh, uh, um, of this patient. Uh, a flower, which again is an image of fecundity, productivity, um, and so on. So that's one. And then the other one is the, this website and uh, Jonathan or I will send you the link to it. It's really marvelous. Uh, this is the Garden of Earthly Delights by Bosch. Uh, you have the panel of, well, first panel, which is the Garden of Eden, then the Garden of Earthly Delights, which is supposed to be earth and then uh, hell. So I'll just click on it so you can hear the sounds. And then you can get into the details. Birds feeding humans. Okay, you get the you get the picture. Um, so it's a it's a lovely and amazing resource to look into, um, and it gives us incredibly detailed uh, possibility of analysis, uh, unlike what Berger has done, I think. So, okay, I will stop here. Um, we'll take a five minute break, maybe just so you can stretch and get some water and then we'll come back and, and we'll address 
more questions and comments that you have either about this outline or about the readings. Okay. All right, I'll see you in five minutes then.
hi 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 and welcome back okay so let's open up with some questions or comments uh, that you have either from what i was saying or from from the texts um hi yeah i was gonna mention uh, comment something about bosch and how like uh in his painting and in fantasy in general i think like the um, impression of superabundance and like planet plentitude usually comes from like a rearrangement of uh, reality itself right so like there's a different like assemblage of the elements of reality itself uh, so like an unicorn is like a mixture of a horse and a horn right so and that yeah. creates a different like and I think that's that chimerization is like applicable to most fantasies. And like I think Pokemon is a good example of this, like how Pokemons are actually animals who are a little bit different, and, and through that difference they become like fantastic, right? Um, so it's interesting to me how how fantasy is kind of actually reality, right? It's real, it's uh it's not uh something from the outside, it's just the inside rearranged. Yeah. No, it's a great point. I, 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 I love what you said. Um, Pokemon is really something similar to what exists. They look totally alien to me. Yeah, because I think most of them are just kind of animals. You know, one of them is like, like a rat, but, but it's a, like a rat, but it's like a different color or something like that. Or it's like a horse, but it's on fire or something like that, right? Yes, okay. Yeah, I haven't looked deeply into it, but I believe you. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. That's a really great point uh, that uh, it's a rearrangement of existing reality. Uh, and that's pretty much really what is necessary for a new reality to occur. Um, it's, it, it reminds me of several things here. One is just, just this, the sheer idea from contemporary physics which everyone or most everyone knows which is that nothing in the cosmos ever really disappears it only changes forms and uh, energetic principles so nothing can totally and utterly disappear matter in terms of matter uh, that's a fascinating thought. Uh, it's kind of basic thought of life, uh, which we don't really consider seriously enough, I think. So that's just what you were saying too. Everything then, it's a, just a rearrangement. Uh, and a rea what constitutes a reality is reassembling it. And maybe what constitutes the utopia or alternative reality is reassembling what's already there. So that's one thing. It, it also goes well, I think, with this, the idea of, you know, that there's no really, um, I, for me, you use the term fantasy, but for me, there's no real proper objective distinction between dream and reality. Uh, both seep into each other constantly and both real. Oh, I think your, your audio, I think it's cut up again. Dan? Hi, Dan. He had the idea, he got the idea from the from the uh yeah, on your out again. Uh hi, if you if you could like repeat the last like few seconds because I think your your audio was silent. I will. Uh so what it reminds me another thing that it reminds me uh of what you said, Romulo, is the uh, Walter Benjamin's uh idea that belongs to his messianic thinking which a lot of people don't like uh, now too. It's not in fashion, but it's an inspiration that he gets from all Jewish folk tales. And he says, 
he recounts this one of these tales. Uh, this is Walter Benjamin, and he says in this in the you know this tale he says there's a conversation. What will the next world look like? And the person answers, just like this one, but a little bit different. It's as if the whale fluttered. That's it. And I always like this explanation because it's so subtle. And re it reminds me of, you know, what you were saying that re it, what is a dream? It's just a real, not just, I mean, it's a serious thing, but it's a readjustment and rearrangement of what we call reality. And then with the, now this is the crucial point, with the rearrangement and reassembling of reality, we have a totally new nature. You know, it's kind of like the, I think, like the, uh, the movie uh, Annihilation and the, which was based on the book uh, where there's, a, there's an unknown uh, biological force imbuing in, a, in one section of nature and it's changing uh, everything that enters into that zone, namely human beings are transforming and everything else is transforming, uh, mutating, animals are mutating. It's kind of like Bosch's painting brought to life, uh, but it's, it's the same thing. Um, so we can also in that regard say that what constitutes evolution, it's constant reassembling. Uh, of molecular elements, which can go into the direction of development or under development in any direction. So that's really at the core. Thank you. Hey, wanted to ask. Oh, sorry. Oh, go, sorry. Ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question about um, how you think this differs from the idea of animation and you've talked about emanation in, in this context and a lot of what you've been saying I think um, I fi find certain parallels with this idea of animism which also has a kind of theological um, history but has also been de-theologized in recent discussions of aesthetics and then of course you know by the Frankfurt School and I'm curious whether this feels um, uh, opposed to you to the idea of charisma or if maybe it captures something about charisma looked at beyond the image like do these concepts um, are they resonant with for you or or would you find them to be like is animism too theological um yeah thanks yeah thank you great question you could say that you know everything that i was saying is a form of animism so your intuition is correct. Uh, I see myself aligned with these, the theories of animism. I would say, I was going to say both in contemporary uh, discussions in, 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 the, in the art world, but even more so in the old anthropological sense of the term in which uh, animism was practiced uh, and continues to be practiced by small scale societies around the world. So I see, I see myself aligned with that. Uh, so absolutely, there is a form of animism um, in this, this charismatic disposition. Uh, now, is this theological or not? That's a, also a really good question. Uh, and a difficult question, as you intuitively pointed out again. And uh, the best I could say is that it's a form of religious atheism. Okay. Um, now, what does that mean? As you, as you know, Catherine, and it's probably some of you too, uh, animism holds that everything in the world uh, is alive, to put it crudely in that sense. Um, everything has a soul. 
but more importantly, it's a form of uh, immanent philosophy, meaning that we are embedded in the animist universe and we are part of this uh, animist universe and we participate in it just like everything else in the world, alive and not alive, uh, uh, by being immanently present in it. So it, uh, I love this theory because it uh, claims that everything is alive and that there is no hierarchy of life, if you will. Uh, rather than that there is a, a transcendence, some Your audio is out again. I think he can only hear us when you. Guard, I, I love animus. Uh, John, could you go back 30 seconds? We lost your audio. Okay. So I, I was saying that, that animism relates to uh, philosophies of immanence uh, as opposed to philosophies of transcendence. And in philosophies of transcendence, you will have the absolute otherness or the absolute other, which is God or ideas or whatever else, paradise and everything that constitutes um, purity, um, the other life, the elsewhere and so on. In the immanent uh, uh, sphere, everything is here. And this is what uh, animism corresponds to. And this is, you know, why I, it's aligned. I, I'm aligned with it, if you will. Uh, especially if you think in terms of atmospheric um, modalities of the charismatic gesture. Now, I mentioned it's a form of religious atheism. That's not, again, I'm just, you know, kind of improvising here. Uh, because, uh, so in that regard, it's not totally theological because uh, I take theological determinations to be those that see the divine or God as a person. If you do not see the divine or God as person, you are in a strange um, sphere of pantheism or atheism, okay? So if we don't have a personhood in the divine sphere, you know, what is that? So I would just say it's a form of religious atheism. It's a form of animism, um, you know, and many artists and many writers uh, are actually aligned with, the, with those dispositions. And some of them we will read. And some of them I mentioned, like Clarice Lispector, for example. Uh, so that's all present there. Um, remember also, and this is something that Isabel Stanger discusses, and I think in the art world, uh, ideas about animism, I think curators are pulling a lot from her. Um, there is a practice of sorcery, magic and sorcery, which is a traditional practice uh, from around the world um, in which elements of nature or particular objects uh, are manipulated, imbued with certain substances, which gives them interior power to be effective for the well-being or the opposite of the other. So in that regard, do I, you know, do I think charismatic image, if it's imbued and emanating this power is also a form of sorcery that's related to animism? Yes, absolutely. Is it, uh, is it fair to also maybe relate those sort of 
places of power to rearrangement. I guess I mean that in um, in the same way that the Deleuze quote goes that the worst of all possible worlds would be in someone else's dream, flip side mm -hmm. being the best in your own. And yet maybe like the power of something like the Stones of Madness is this sort of like synthesis or biodiversity of many dreams existing at the same time, or like this sense of rearrangement and a sense of like future possibility of worlds. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, that's a really rich question I, uh, that I can't answer on the spot. Uh, but I think this, what you just posed, is something that will be, you know, answered in the decades to come. And, you know, I, I really encourage you, if you're interested in this, to write this question down and to try to answer it for yourself as well. Uh, this is, it's something that I think so, so you addresses too in different modes of existence. Uh, but on the most basic level, it's a question of what constitutes multiplicity or multiple worlds uh, and how, how do we represent that? You know, how is it put into effect? Uh, I think that we don't know uh, for a number of reasons. One, just being uh, living for, sense, for millennia in a dualistic world, conception of the world, not multiple. Uh, just on the most crude basic level in the in the western philosophy but this this is something that goes through non-western philosophies as well there are three large conceptualizations of the world one is monistic world that the world is uh, uh, monistic meaning that there is only one substance for the entire cosmos and infinite number of manifestations of that substance, okay? Now take into account the repercussions of that. It means that there is no such thing as opposites. It's all part of one, okay? It's, this is even hard for us to think, let alone, you know, live by it. Um, then with, but it's still, it's a, it's a worldview that I, I really love. Uh, then there's a dualism, the worldview of the dualism, which is that there are, you know, binary distinctions and dualistic opposites like good and evil, and they don't have anything to do with one another. Um, night and day, black and white, I mean, you name it, it just goes on and on and on into infinity. Um, and for some reason, human societies have, for the most part, adopted this way of conceptualizing the world. Both philosophically and in pre-philosophical times. Odd, strange thing. Uh, it also, allow this allows us to develop ideas of us and others, friend and enemy. So, so it goes. So, and then there's a third, which they call, or is called pluralism or, you know, plurality, which means that the world is constituted by the multitude of worlds or pl plural worlds. So, you know, this is, I think your question is, is embedded uh, into this. Uh, if we follow Deleuze that you mentioned, who introduced the concept of multiplicity uh, into philosophy more explicitly in the 1970s and 80s. Before that, it wasn't really explicitly discussed. Um, you remember, uh, and I remember from Thousand Plateaus, uh, the magnificent thing is that they speak about individual as being multiple. So I am a multiplicity, you are a multiplicity, and you know, and so on it goes, uh, which is a marvelous and beautiful idea that I cannot be identified by the properties that social institutions uh, identify me with. 
you know, of my nation or of my gender or whatever. Uh, I am constituted already by innumerable multiple dimensions, which are human and inhuman and conceptual and concrete and physical and energetic and, you know, and you name it. So how can I uh, describe this multiplicity? How can I inscribe that multiplicity into the world um, uh, represented if it's, you know, represented and so on. So they come up with the term, which you probably remember too, uh, schizoanalysis, which is a, their method to analyze um, events, encounters, and so on. Now, I only mention this because we're, we again come to the, to the uh, vocabulary of, I don't know, psychiatry, you know, stone of madness, we're into the madness, schizoanalysis, but they are all dealing, as you said, as you mentioned, with apprehension of multiplicity. So, how, you know, for Deleuze and Guattari, how do we rep, uh, apprehend this multiplicity? Well, through schizoanalysis, meaning we have to not become schizophrenic, but extract a molecule of schizophrenia, just a little bit, uh, which is a molecule of constant rupturing. Schizo means rupture. And through that, perceive, experience, understand, encounter constant rupturing that occurs in the world, right? So we can, we can, in other words, more intimately connect to that multiplicity. Oh, your audio is cut again. I think when the audio is cut, uh, he can't hear anything. Uh, I think it's like a complete shutdown. Yeah. I would... yeah. Okay, I'm okay. Live. okay, sorry. I'm saying what, what, Can you hear me? You're back now. I'm back, okay. Uh, so what I was saying, uh, I'll, I'll bring a bug puppet next time. Um, um, that what Matthew was saying, I like this idea of what, what is embedded in the rock or stone of madness what multiplicity is embedded in this uh, stone, if you will, uh, in this image of the rock, uh, what type of madness, what type of multiplicity? I can only repeat your question because I don't know the answer to that, but this is something, you know, if I was, uh, when I look at the painting, uh, when I look at the writing uh, of Pizarnik, that's the question that I would ask. Uh, because as I said, I think what they do is they actually constitute in their work this stone. And now for us, the question is also, what type of multiplicity is that? Multiple worlds and so on. But we don't know what that means, you know, bringing together multiple worlds together into one. I know other people have questions, but may I ask a, just a slight follow up to that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, I, I guess, like speaking of Pizarnik, yeah, there's, I suppose, sort of like this magnetism in the multiplicity. I mean, I think there's probably few political things that anyone can imagine Octavio Paz and Roberto Bolaño agreeing upon. And yet they both would have credited Pizarnik as like the greatest poem 
or the greatest poet that was alive or ever perhaps mm -hmm. and I guess I sort of wonder that if like that multiplicity can come uh sort of like be extracted as this rupture is that kind of can that be viewed similarly as like tacunist destitution and like the idea to move away into rupture is to sort of like forego any but well necessarily forgo any sort of dualisms but necessarily forgo like conflicts into a different multiple uh i can only say yes now i would have to read them again to to you know answer this properly but why connect to that because because we're looking for some political resolvement of this multi mul multiplicity and rupture or what is what is behind that question or concern uh i suppose i just read into like the idea of destitution through mm -hmm. like tacoon and the invisible community invisible committee mm -hmm. as like very focused on like on multiplicity and very focused on like rather uh i mean i suppose it's like to create within people the same thing that i think like maybe pizarnik would have or bosch would have created within the stone of madness but to create it in like not an object or a gesture but in like a way of being okay okay i get it now thank you um yes uh so i i am i am I think, you know, Tycoon and, and Invisible Committee have the same inspiration from similar sources, like what we're discussing now. Uh, if the, how to transpose that this into a community, that I don't know, honestly. And what I'm dealing, what I'm here, this, this is why I'm careful with discussing uh, individuals. And it, you know, individual artist, individual writer, individual thinker, individual, you know, human or non-human. I'm a little bit wary of transposing this into the into the community uh, before us understanding also what constitutes a community, what is a community. I, I think it's totally unclear. It is unclear. We're all using the word, everyone's using the word, but it just, it's one of these, you know, words that's like, everyone thinks it's totally clear, but it's not actually. So, but again, the, the, the concepts that Can you hear me? You're back. Okay. I have no idea what's going on. On my, I, I have like the, the strongest internet connection ever, uh, but Zoom does this to me. Uh, it just drops the sound. I hear you, you know, I see you, but it just takes away the sound. I don't know. It's something suspicious, but in any case, uh, as I was saying to Matthew's question, uh, I like the, the word destitution and, you know, trying to implement that into the, into the communal aspect, but I don't want to really, um, I wouldn't go that far. I'm going to stay with the individual, you know, uh, because when you look at Pizarnik, for example, this is highest degree of sorcery. Uh, it's highest degree of uncompromising uh, disposition uh, to undo herself, her own identity. Uh, uh, you know, to become inhuman, um, and it just you know, 
just a whole range of absolutely incredible, uh, incredible, stunning things. So first define what community is uh, clearly and properly. Uh, and then maybe we can, you know, talk, not you, I'm saying outside uh, the, the, the world. Uh, and then maybe we can approach it. I have another personal um, suspicion about it. And I'll tell you now, if, if you don't mind, just me giving, giving you briefly a biographical note. Uh, so I grew up in Croatia, which was Yugoslavia before. So I grew up in communism and it collapsed when I was at, finishing high school. Um, and I always had kind of weird relationship to it. Uh, when I was really young, when I was a kid, I wanted to get out as soon as possible. Mostly because of architecture. I hated the, the, the buildings we lived in, but now I like them. So, uh, but in any case, there were other things, you know, socially that just were, were, were bad. But I'm saying all this because of one thing. Uh, as I started studying it more, you know, later on uh, and admiring communist ideas. Uh, for me, one of the failure of communism in Yugoslavia was Can you hear me? Okay, I uh, just fall, listen, look at the, the Andrew's gestures hand and the countdown has been correct. Uh, um, here, just <laughs> quickly before then cut off again. Uh, uh, what I admired about communist Yugoslavia was the partisans that fought in uh, Second World War. Um, and kind of ushered this communism. Now, that kind of friendship, uh, communal per collaboration, participation, uh, generosity, loyalty, willingness to die for another, I mean, it's just, just so admirable, it's incredible. But as soon as they won, as soon as they exited the forests and started forming society, it became totalitarian. So this is a huge problem, you know, how to uh, prevent a crystallization of totalitarian molecule uh, from crystallizing in the community? I don't know. Uh, and I don't think anyone has answered it properly. Uh, but what I have seen is, you know, it, there, they did exist, this kind of generosity existed before the formation, before it's crystallized into society. So this is why I don't like speaking about community, abstract community, or even society. Uh, because for me, there's always a totalitarian molecule uh, present there. And I don't know yet how for it not to be there. So let me just mention this too, uh, because we touched on it now. And, and because we mentioned the Luz and Guattari, uh, where does this uh, totalitarianism come in? How does it come in? Well, it latches itself onto the heart, which is to say onto desire. So desire is really a place in which amorous, affective and political dispositions unravel so we you know in some sense it's the it's about training one's own desire in a way 
and attempting to prevent the, uh, this totalitarian molecule to form or crystallize itself. And that's something that, you know, we have to do all the time. Name, let's just put it in a more simple, in more simple terms, what would be totalitarian molecule, the expression of it to dominate others. So, you know, how do you um, transmit that on the social level, on the communal level? Really, it's hard. It's hard. It necessitates change of consciousness. So, you know, and how, what does that look like? How do you, you know, start to change consciousness of the people? Very, very difficult. So, you know, I, I'd rather start with, I'd rather deal with small concrete things. For example, words, you know, what is the specific word? What is the specific effect of this object? What is the specific effect of this gesture of this, you know, text or image and so on? Yeah, um, can I just, I wanted to ask something or comment on something that was talked um, about before. And when you talked about Bosch, it really reminded me also of, of, of science fiction not looking at science fiction just kind of like this um let's say trivial prediction of future but more of a kind of like very specific model to imagine concrete alternative modes of being let's say for emancipatory purposes or i know that samuel delaney has this quote that um, science fiction is a kind of significant distortion of the present so um yeah how would this then tie back into the what you were talking um, in relation to the plenitude and maybe the capacity of art to yeah you know indicate modes of being otherwise of alternative words uh worlds not in some sort of a romantic or, or romanticized way but in a very concrete way that then would also produce us um, let's say material effects in the quote unquote real worlds it, does that make sense mm -hmm. Well, totally, totally. You're so you're totally clear, uh, Sebastian. Just writing a couple of words to remember. But uh, first, yes, with science fiction, uh, you're absolutely right. I think uh, you know, contemporary or non-contemporary science fiction has more profound political theory than any political theory departments in the world now for the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, and I'm thinking here of Octavia Butler, uh, Ursula Le Guin. I mean, without a doubt, these are uh, incredible suggestions uh, for alternative worlds, you know, this is, uh, uh, and science fiction is now probably the richest field in which these uh, reimaginations uh, are occurring. There's another, there's a, uh, a Mexican writer uh, that I, that I like and, and know, Carmen Buyosa, Buyosa. Um, I can't remember the title of her novel too. It's a science fiction novel, which is also, I mean, mind blowing too. So yes, absolutely. The, the, the imagination of the alternative world, which constitutes another dream, possible dream, uh, is definitely, you know, the inspiration comes from science fiction. And this is something that another professor at, at uh, the New Center will, can, will tell you much more about Ed Keller uh, because he re reads uh, viciously uh, every, every science fiction book that's ever been out there. So this is something to, to ask Ed, he'll give you amazing answers. Uh, but yes, for me, the concern is how do we construct an alternative dream um, for ourselves and for the world? 
uh, now that occurs through science fiction. Uh, it occurs through literature as well, of course. Uh, and it occurs through philosophy and, you know, art in general. Why? Because it's, I think this is still, it's, it's again, art is one of these words that just totally lost meaning. Um, and, and, you know, to speak of it in general art, I mean, who knows what that means, but if I could for a second talk about it in these generalist terms, uh, for me, art is, and literature too, is about production of unforeseen sensations. Uh, that, is, that is what I require uh, from art, so-called art. Uh, production of unforeseen sensations which means that it will give me some kind of uh, strange reaction uh, and recognition within me that I did not recognize before. This, in other words, also uh, uh, initiates further my imagination about the world, which is to say relationships that I built with the world. How I relate to you, how I relate to the birds outside, how I relate to the air, how I relate dot, 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 you name it. So I, I hope this, you know, addresses what you said. I just want to mention on, finally another thing which is how you ended. And this, I have a peculiar maybe madness about this, uh, which is for me, everything has material effects, everything. So it's not just looking for, you know, political program, which will then be implemented and it can have specific concrete effects in reality, no. The, what I'm just, the, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, what I'm projecting now with words has material uh, effects. And again, I, I accept it could be just my insanity, but this is my belief. So for me, a poem has a material effect. Um, you know, a, a gesture, specific gesture, intentional gesture done with intention has material effect and so on and so forth, you name it. So this is why we're looking at this uh, a charismatic image uh, because of its potential effects that are not perhaps obvious. Uh, but for me, they're always there. If I can use uh, the words also that Soryo uses in his description of this existence that he calls sur existence, which is plurimodal. He says it's an existence that is expressed through fervor and lucidity. I remember those terms, uh, those words, you know, because he gives some specificity and precision to this experience of this particular type of existence, fervor and lucidity. So everything has material effect. Some things obviously have a stronger effect. things that carry particular, you know, modalities. What are those? Well, for me, for example, if I follow him, uh, uh, things, existence with fervor and lucidity will have a very concrete and material uh, effect. Obviously, you know, when we say we live in someone else's dream, it means we live according to a whole set of property, properties that's been set up for us. Um, and this is what 
most of us are, are criticizing uh, to, to begin with, um, whatever the values are of the, of the present age, accumulation, the value of accumulation, um, the value of um, uh, monetary exchange, building relationships according to monetary exchange and so on. Okay, maybe one more question. Sure, yeah, I have a, if I could go, I have a question and a comments on sorcery. Sure. Uh, sorcery is the title or theme of our first session on the syllabus. And it's also one of, one of the titles of Pizarnik's works in, in this collection. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if there's a, that's a coincidence or there's an, it's an intentional for you to put it like that, but I'm just asking what kind of ideas are you extracting from that kind of connections and that specific uh, poem or prose he's uh, laid out in the, in the collection. And the comment is that there is a innate a connection between sorcery and gift that mm. all over the world among different sorceries, there's a gift or talent that the sorcerer or sorceress has to be tested or examined or go through some kind of ceremonies to be gathered. And I think there's in that, that dimension that uh, sorcery is very close to charisma. If you if we explain it in a, in a sense of gift, gift, what's more intriguing for me is that if we assume that there's a true sorcery which is tested and based on true gift, there could be a false or faked uh, charisma or sorcery. And what's gonna happen when these two meet each other? I remember there's a very weird story in a in Kata Saman, a Middle East uh, writer's collection called Square Moon, and the title was Metallic Crocodile or something like that, <laughs> which describes a, a, a like a, a practitioner of mystic practices and sorcerers. Uh, sorcery met someone who actually has some kind of super supernatural magical powers, and that is a very weird story. And I will definitely want to look back in, into that story for on this subject. Yeah, it was kind of long, but that was my points, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if you have a PDF of that uh, story, please send it to me. Um, okay, uh, well, this would, you know, I could, I should prepare a whole, a whole other set lecture on, on sorcery, perhaps to address this properly, but um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of reasons why uh, it interests me. I'll mention a few here. Uh, one is because it is a practice, traditionally speaking, as you mentioned too. Hear me? Not yet. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, the the uh, what I love about sorcery is number of things. Uh, number one, it deals with uh, absolute materiality or substances, material substances. So each object has to be materially treated, uh, and again, this comes from my early anthropological trainings. Uh, I had an amazing professor in Belgium uh, who was initiated into, uh, you know, several, several secret societies in Zaire and he would bring uh, objects to show us, uh, but he, he, you know, advises not to touch them and rightly so uh, because they were smeared with transgressive substances. So maybe that's you know the was the first moment where you know, i i felt incredible attraction to this uh and also to all societies that are glued in this manner which is the manner of uh some sort of an initiation So anyway, there's a, there's a, so first there's this uh, uh, extreme materiality of things and objects that are at play in the act of or construction 
construction of sorcery. The other thing that I really like is its artisanal uh, transmission. It's like, uh, you know, other artisanal practices, which is uh, uh, you learn as an apprentice and then you get, you uh, attain a skill. And that skill differentiates you potentially from others. So for me, this is also a magnificent, magnificent image uh, for thinking, for thought, for writing. Uh, so, you know, this is why I, uh, maybe gravitate towards writers like Pizarnik, who is explicit too about, you know, the element of sorcery in her writing. So for example, this segment that you rightly pointed out, it's just one paragraph called sorcery. Uh, you can kind of see this hypermateriality that I was speaking about. Uh, I'll just read one, one uh, line or section, no section of the line. The lining of my breath with reddish spit and floating veils of blood, my blood, mine alone, which I drew myself and which, which they drink from now and dot, 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 dot. Okay. Now, what can I say about this particularly? First thing that we see is the form. It's one sentence, one sentence paragraph. Uh, it's like an entrapment. Uh, with multiple strange images, which put when put together constitute something that we could call sorcery. So that's here, but it's really, you know, kind of present throughout. The other thing that uh, to me, I relate to art in general, and especially certain artists uh, who have a sense of secrecy embedded in their work okay um, this is a pure modality of sorcery if you will so um, again louise bourgeois saying as soon as you put the object Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I blame this on Andrew. It's just weird. It's the, whenever he said, you know, says yes, it starts working. So uh, I'm a magic man. What can I say? Yes, indeed. Uh, so Louise Bourgeois, you know, saying whenever you put sculpture into a public space, it loses power. Um, Hilmarf Clint. insisting on not showing her paintings during her lifetime and 20 years after her death. Where do you get these ideas? This is incredible, incredible. Uh, you know, talking about the stone of madness, uh, but with such odd precision and, and such conviction that I am also convinced that they are right. And not only because I read it or I see it, I look at the work. I look at the work and I can say, oh my God, they are right. Because it's there. So, you know, this, the injection, these are all, what should we call it? Molecules of sorcery, if you will, uh, that uh, happen, unravel, I don't know, through study, through discipline, through um, non-compromising and so on. Uh, it reminds me of uh, also an Argentine writer, Macedonio Fernandez. I think it's only one book is translated into English. Uh, and he had, he had the similar approach of writing one of his novels and then putting it into the shell into a drawer 
and leaving it there for 20 years. And then he takes it out and says, okay, now it's ready. I mean, you have to be insane, but also where does the charm and the charismatic gesture comes from? From the resistance to be timely from the resistance to participate in, you know, whatever it is, literary discourses or, or art discourses of the time, uh, which would give one presumably power. So, you know, this is this uh, a strange gesture, which is kind of a sorcerer's gesture of uh, retaining oneself um, having an element of secrecy. Um, so yeah, I don't know if this answer answers your question, but uh, I think, as I mentioned, uh, Isabel Stanger has a book, I think now on sorcery and something and ways in which it connects to philosophy. She's more interested, she's more influenced by the movement of witches in North America like witches from 1960s until now. Um, and I'm looking more at, you know, specific traditional practices um, in, in uh, small scale societies. Um, can I just say an Ursula Le Guin quote really quickly since sure, you brought her ahead, up yeah. earlier in relation to sorcery. Um, she just said, Magic exists in most societies in one way or another, and one of the form it exists in a lot of places. If you know a thing's true name, you have power over the thing or the person. And of course, it's irresistible because I'm a writer. I use words and knowing the names of it, of things is doing magic because I make up things that didn't exist before naming them, which I think, you know, relates to science fiction in general. Um, and of this like, also in the different um, modes of existence, I feel like a big um, emphasis was inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. Just like to remake, I, I feel like that's just kind of like, um, they were saying that past responding, like um, the next step past just responding to something is the act of renovating and making something new. And I feel like that kind of relates to this realm of like sorcery, sci-fi, and um, just kind of like, yeah, the, the modes of existence and things like that. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, take it, now, this reminds me of what Pez was saying. Uh, remember when people do analysis or when we do analysis or interpretations of texts or, or of social forces, um, Usually analysis, even the best ones, stay on the level of diagnosis. Uh, and that's awesome, that's great. It's hard to diagnose the world in which we live because we live in it. Uh, it's easier to diagnose you know, the past, uh, history, but the present, it's hard. So uh, you know, it's admirable to already be able to diagnose things uh, of the present. Um, now, even harder, and this is what very few people do, is actually provide a vision that goes beyond the diagnosis, okay? And these are rare individuals, uh, artists, writers, sometimes philosophers, and so on. Uh, but for me, this is the, you know, the highest degree, if you will, of thought or in saturation uh, that Paige mentioned, uh, recreation, uh, whatever, or reassemblages, uh, reassembling things that Matthew mentioned. Uh, for that, you require vision. And yes, it happens in science fiction uh, a lot, but in other, in other domains uh, as well. Uh, but this is why science fiction is so, I don't know, I guess productive because they just project vision more than deal with diagnosis. Uh, critical theory is all diagnosis. So something 
in between or you know something where both touch uh, to me is maybe most productive and most interesting uh, where you have both diagnosis and vision uh, that cuts through the present if you will or or through this this diagnosis okay Let's stop. Uh, I would still like to hear a little bit from you and, and what interests you. Um, so let's take a five minute break, not more than five uh, and come back and we can talk about maybe the assignment uh, and uh, also what interests you. So I just want to hear, you know, In one minute, what interests you? And if you uh, if you have an idea of what kind of charismatic modality you would like to address in the assignment, uh, please say it. So uh, uh, the assignment, of of course, you can do it at at, at the end, but I would like to discuss it in, in all three next sessions like this uh, at the end. So you will have kind of mini presentations, three mini presentations versus one huge one, okay? Uh, just so that I can give you a little bit of a feedback too. Um, so I'll write this down in the, in the, in the, I'll post it for all of you to see later today. But um, what I would like you to do is find one charismatic image or object or gesture, whatever it is, uh, event that you consider could be charismatic according to some of these ideas that we talked about or according to your own ideas, okay? Drawing event, image, uh, phenomenon, um, you name it, any of those. And then in another, in the following uh, seminar, uh, you have to find a concept or, or notions that emanate from this image, okay? Uh, so at the end, it's going to be your own configuration your own your own constellation uh, of this object or image or whatever it is. You can obviously use texts and ideas that uh, you know we are mentioning, but you can also use whatever else comes from the outside for you. You know. Okay, well, let's take three minute break and then. Just, I want to hear, hear from you and, and briefly what interests you here, okay? See you in a bit.
Okay. I can just start uh, uh, and call you out um, as I see you on the screen, the name, okay? Paige. Hi. Hi, um, I am Paige, based in Los Angeles, and um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist exploring like the ecological body and mm. its phenomenological relations to the environment. So I'm, uh, I think, especially interested in this notion of like the atmospheric that you were talking about, um, which I'm still kind of grasping exactly what that means in relation to charisma, but. Um, that is the thing I'm most interested in exploring right now within this class. Cool, very cool, thank you. Andrew? Hey, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we hear you. Excellent, okay. Uh, I had to ask because my laptop has decided to go a completely blank screen, so I'm going in blind. Um, but uh, at this point, uh, obviously my name is Andrew, or at least one of many, many names. Um, I am pretty much an independent scholar, uh, interested in various avant-garde movements, uh, but basically pretty much whatever I can get my hands on, I tend to use to some degree or another. Um, so I won't exhaust you with an endless list of possible interests, but right now I'm gonna need to sink in a little bit more into the ideas that are being presented in the class. Although a couple of things from the readings is this possible tension between the idea of the sort of charismatic multiplicity or plenitude versus let's just say the death mask of the real um mm -hmm. gonna need to sink a little bit more into that i think i stumbled a little bit into a side conversation on magic and the idea of various uh supernatural or paranatural creatures as methods of concepts but we'll kind of see how this all plays out <laughs> awesome thank you that was great Feng? Sure, yeah, I'm Feng. I am a prospective student of comparative literature, and I'm Chinese based in here and there in China. Here, now I'm in Beijing, and um, there are multiple concepts I'm thinking related with, uh, with charisma, and now the one in my mind is exception, that I feel like, yeah, a charismatic person is always the except, exception of our moral standards, social rules, or whatever we have in our mundane um, everyday life. And I'm just thinking about if, if a normal person without charisma went, went drunk and just sleep outside on, the, outside on the streets, and that became a very mundane scene. If someone with charisma do that, then it becomes something trans transcendental and even artistic, if we can put it like that just some free thoughts since you asked so excellent thank you thank you jean-jacques hi hi um i'm jean-jacques i'm a filmmaker and media artist um the entire uh, part of like creating a a sort of like a an aura the, the, the kind of like the spatial I think, what was it that he called it? Spatial delirium, <laughs> as Berger calls it, is something that really interests me. But since I'm coming from an artistic practice, I'm really interested in the gestural sort of component of it, um, the design component. Um, and um, the I, I really like what you said about artist production of unforeseen sensations or states. I, I like to call them also like glitches, or factors as Matthew maybe called them earlier, like they have maybe of Ipse with Bataille tied with initiation. So like going into the altered state and, or dealing with the surregion in a way as well, which is actually something that I wanted to comment earlier. And I just wanted to make a little note of, which I think is gonna come back earlier because we're dealing with Schultz and Roger Gilbert Lacombe later. But the, the idea that in this process of the, I don't know how you would call it, worlding or something, mm -hmm. the conjuring, um, that 
we can attain the marvelous, but the marvelous is also the monstrous, which I think is something that is obviously very present in Pizarnik and uh, Hieronymus Bosch. Um, anyway, just just that like th there's a lot there's a lot of that that, that really uh, interests me. But yeah, at the end of the day, the entire idea of the charismatic image, I think that it's the idea of that plenitude that you were saying. And how can that be attained in the moment too, right? Like the, again, going back to that idea of the, the break through the practice, um, the, the dance um, that can lead them. I think it was, what's her name? Filmmaker Deborah Stradman called it taunting the void. Um, so anyway, I thought, I, 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 I'm curious about that. Um, and funny enough, I'm originally from Ecuador, but I'm actually in Española, New Mexico, oh. just 30 minutes from oh, Santa right. Fe. Yeah, I was there yesterday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And I, I can second, it's a beautiful day. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. That's awesome. Well, send me an email. Uh, let's meet up while you're here. Cool. Uh, this is great. Yeah, we'll come back to many of these issues uh, uh, definitely, and you should raise them again um, in the coming sessions. Kensani, McKensani? Hey, um, <laughs> you got it right the first time. Um, well, the, the reason why I chose this seminar, um, especially the idea of like thinking about charisma, it has to do with my surname also. Kari. <laughs> I found that very funny. Yeah, <laughs> I found that funny. But also thinking about the idea of sorcery and magic um, and the link between sort of like the English language and magic, sort of like in English, we spell words. We also cast spells. Um, we have grandma and we have like a grim, grim, grimoire. Is that what it's called? Um, yeah, we have magical rites we write you know in language so like i'm, I'm interested in those um ideas even thinking about um how like in bantu languages we speak to individuals as multiplicities so when i greet you uh i say dumelang which means like it's sort of like referring to a group and not an individual which is like mm. interesting mm -hmm. um and the two sort of um texts i'm thinking of using are either like uh, Cizé's um, letter to my native land, I think that's the title, um, and hypothesis of the stolen painting, like as as film. And I don't know, I don't know how I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna find a way to um, make something of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just a quick note. Uh, there's an amazing book, a uh, little collection of Cizé's wife. Suzanne Césaire is her name. Uh, and uh, I think she talks directly there about magic and sorcery. Uh, she's nice. awesome, Suzanne Césaire is her name. Cool, thank you so much, Tijan. You got it. Uh, Atefe? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I am uh, Atefe, I'm from Iran, but currently I live in Poland. I'm an MA student in gender studies. And uh, actually, uh, I'm so happy that somehow we ended up talking about utopias or possible worlds because that's what I'm currently trying to work, work on. Uh, but I'm now somehow thinking of it as uh, like some sort of uh, heterotopias more than uh, utopias. And I was thinking if it would be possible and actually, I'm thinking about communities, but not communities that are that have a boundary, a space and time, a spatial temporal boundaries. I was thinking if we can uh, think about like more diverse uh, communities, and maybe I was thinking about charisma as a way of like uh, the charismatic image or uh, or person or objects as like some kind of agent uh, calling you to a kind of community or like a shaman that opens the door uh, for you uh, to a kind of uh, i don't know uh, what that com that community would can be based on it can be like maybe some concept values or anything uh, 
I know now it may sound a little bit mystic, but I'm, I will, uh, I wanted to try to somehow demystify it and uh, make it more concrete. Great, that's, that's our attempt here for sure, uh, to make the mystical concrete. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Kosramani. Hi everyone, yeah, I'm Jonathan. I am uh, currently a certificate student at the New Center and I will be doing my PhD in politics. We start on that in September. And I'm interested in sort of like the Anthropocene and one of the reasons I did this is not just because Jason recommended this class, but because um, also this idea of atmosphere and there's sort of like the climatology of everything here so that sort of it fits quite well there but it's also something to like experiment with and learn new stuff so yeah great great climatology that's exactly it great thank you heather um hi uh can you hear me okay yep yeah mm -hmm. okay good um i'm heather i'm from glasgow in scotland and I'm currently uh, doing a master's degree in classics, so like Greco-Roman literature and history. But my background is in fine art, and well, my undergraduate background is in uh, fine art and what we call in Britain continental <laughs> philosophy. And sure, sure. Um, yeah, when I think about charismatic images, um, for me, the most charismatic image um, is the famous uh, Bader Meinhof poster, mm. the wanted poster. Mm. Um, when mm. I was younger, I mean, when I was like, a teenager, it always reminded me of, um, and I know you want to like take away the theological, but it did remind me of uh, pictures um, that I would see of um, saints and uh, people who'd been, because I grew up very Catholic, people who'd been canon, canonized in the mm -hmm. Catholic church and stuff, stuff like that. So, but I found it, so to me, that's an image that is, uh, it has this charisma and like the tinge of the theological without being theological. Mm. Um, and I wrote about, for my undergraduate dissertation, I wrote about, um, in part, about these images of these particular terrorists and how they were later, um, like artists um, used them, like uh, Gerhard Richter, but when yeah. he used them, it depleted them of their original yeah. power. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where my head is at. <laughs> great, great, great example, by the way. That's awesome example. And I have that catalog of Gerhard Richter's paintings of those images. Very cool, thank you. Sebastian? Hey, um, I'm Sebastian. I'm also from ex Yugoslavia. I'm from Slovenia nice. and I'm based in Berlin, uh, Germany. I guess what I'm interested in is the very difficulty uh, of theorizing charisma because I think that is something that cannot be really, um, you know, uh, apprehended or um, medi medi mediated appropriately via language mm. but then on the other hand i also don't want to you know make this distinction this distinction between because it's going to somehow reify this yeah distinction between language and experience and it would say that language can never approach experience in like a sufficient way so i also don't want to do that so yeah because also the, let's say the theory and philosophies that i'm most attracted to are the ones that you know incorporate some sort of a poetic um elements that kind of like indicate the inconsistencies in the language itself so doesn't that just describe this experience in a in a, via content but also via form yeah um yeah, yeah just this I, I think it's a an open question or like a, yeah absolutely it's great it's huge i mean i i hope you gathered a little bit also in today that uh form is of utmost importance uh, maybe, well, not maybe in conversation, but in general, I would say form is even more important than content, if I can say that heresy. So we'll come back to that, though. But thank you. Nina? Yeah, hello. Um, I'm based in Cologne in Germany. I'm a painter. 
And um, yeah, I'm very intrigued by this subject of charisma. I think it has, for me, it has a lot to do with the creative process as well. Um, I'm interested in the, in the idea of liminality or sort of when, when we pass certain boundaries. And so this idea of charisma, I find fascinating because it sort of links to the infusion of something different and that when is that moment in the creative process, but also kind of when is that moment when, for example, a painting is finished. So it becomes something of its own and it's like, it repels, I mean, I have that feeling it repels me. And what is it that repels me at the mm. end? And what is it that pulls me at the beginning? And so this kind of motion um, is what I'm interested in. And I think that's my kind of link to charisma. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Alessia? Um, hi, yeah. Um, that's really tough for me because uh, I don't really have any specific training um, in arts or philosophy. So I guess um, that's my first. Here. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, Do so. Do I know what I'm talking about? This is just. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. So, regarding this class, I I should say that this is also my first time taking um, a seminar at the school. So I was really curious to try how this whole thing works, and the title was really intriguing because uh, it's it's really interesting how this idea of charisma applies to so many different things. And my interest um, at this moment, at least. Um, is probably um, lies somewhere in music and um, mm -hmm. the way the way music triggers triggers your body to you know to a movement and that to me personally that not happens all the time like it must be some sort of specific combination of sounds and not necessarily dense movements uh, although dense um, and you know, this idea of community that grows around dance um, mm -hmm. is interesting to me as well. So, I mean, I, I, I guess we're not going to be talking about community that much, but still, it's something that I would maybe in the future, I'd be interested in, um, in learning more about. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a great idea to figure out what this um, individual um, I guess combination of different modes of existence can be at first and then move on to something a little more complex. Uh, but yeah, so I guess somewhere around music uh, at this point, but Great. as well as poetry, perhaps. Yeah, I guess I'm okay. done. <laughs> Thank um, you. Sound is definitely uh, as, as uh, legitimate as any other expression. Um, yeah, just remind me to mention a few things about community in other weeks, uh, and I will. I don't want to dismiss it, but I can point you in the direction of, you know, uh, a line of thinking about community that's very rich, okay? Anna? Hi, um, I'm Anna. I'm based in Niterói. That's a satellite city from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, I got a bachelor, bachelor degree actually in painting, but I'm a multimedia artist. I have a master's on interdisciplinary poetics. So I'm working on actually many, many mediums. I've started on painting and I ended up making a geopoetic trail of four hours with mediated, mm -hmm. a mediated trail. Well, anyways, so my research is actually on thinking as how how I can think of artistical practices having pollination as a methodology. And I just, when I saw the charismatic image uh, seminar, I just said, that's exact, exactly it. Mm -hmm. Because pollination is, um, I mean, a flower, it is actually attracting the, the bee or any other, any other insect that, that goes there. So that's basically what pollination is. And I mean, that's basically it. I've been working on these many mediums, but I've been trying to work on seed paper and what could grow from where you, from where you write or draw on a seed paper and then what a seed paper, what 
what are you writing or saying to the earth? Where are you going to plant it? And I don't know anything that can come out of it. Excellent, thank you. Do you know Clarice Lispector? Yes, yes, I actually know her. <laughs> Everyone does. Yeah, yeah, here, here, in, here in Brazil is actually kind of obvious to quote her. <laughs> it's know, almost like a joke. <laughs> I know, I know. I heard that, uh, breaks my heart. But uh, <laughs> it's like a mem, and it's like a mem here. <laughs> yeah, great, great, great to hear all this. Uh, oh, and the, I, I would just like to add one more thing that I thought that I thought it was like completely synchronical on what you said today. That on my on my research, I've always used a, a little phrase from Isabel Stengues. That mm. is to we have to inhabit the desert of our imagination. But I've already added the biodiversity on that phrase for my research. So oh we have to inhabit with biodiversity at the desert of our imagination. Perfect. I just thought it so completely synchronic. Awesome. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you. Niam? Hi, uh, it's Hi. Neve. Um, I'm. I should uh, clarify, but anyway, uh, I'm uh, so I'm currently based in Greece. I'm I'm Greek Irish. Um, I finished studying like a year ago, and um, have spent this uh, like indeterminate COVID period just like really um, in like a deep dialogue with myself uh, <laughs> about what um, like why I'm interested in in the things that I'm attracted to, which are um, which I found in, in the um, course description, the class description, I was like immediately attracted to it because um, I think a lot about um, embodiment and its relationship to atmosphere and how like bodies and um, things that we like prescribe as an identity like sexuality um, as well as culture is actually something that is like already like materially inscribed is like in the architecture of space. Um, and so I find that relationship really uh, powerful and really interesting. Um, and I think that there's a lot of transformation that can happen when you, uh, you know, use different tools to kind of e expand that. So I use a lot of um, tarot, I'm really interested in systems mm. of um, knowledge that are kind of sidelined when it comes to thinking of the psyche um and uh yeah so and also just like modes of knowledge um transmission that happen kind of in the sidelines as well that aren't really like reported in books but are like passed between people um and how that creates like alternative networks um in terms of a specific charismatic figure um i think paris hilton is like a really funny contradiction um, because I think she's like extremely um, charismatic and also like exemplifies like a total stupidity um, that that like but that I find so compelling for some reason. Uh, so I've thought, uh, yeah, a lot a lot about her, um, and um, I don't know if I'm going to like use her specifically uh, in the <laughs> in this class, but yeah, these. Um, Th these uh, the link between yeah embodiment and like the creation of atmosphere and and then also um, how we use different tools to to transform that and then like technology comes into that as well. But I also think about like tarot as like a form of technology too, not just like silicon based technologies. Sure. Um, yeah. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you for a uh, really stimulating session so far. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, Caroline? Yeah, uh, I'm Caroline. I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm based in Berlin now. Uh, and I'm a writer and editor primarily. And one of the, I think, biggest reasons why I'm really fascinated by the seminar is this very, for me, kind of enticing promise of the charismatic image that's also kind of dark at times. It feels like it's mm. can both have this promising, very alluring, beautiful side to it, but at the same time, also this losing of oneself in an almost destructive sense. And I think for me, this is very fascinating. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
uh, yes, it's the, the, this contradiction that marvelous is also monstrous uh, that was mentioned before. And the limit between the two or the limit where the two meet is what we're trying to explore. Cool, thank you. Nikki? Hello, my name is Nikki. Um, I am living in Hamtramck, which is an enclave of Detroit. And I'm interested in uh, text as an image, text as form itself. Mm. Um, I have studied drawing in my early years before typography. And I, I come from many different trades. Uh, for example, I'm, profesh I'm a professional bookmaker and mm. I came to writing to have content to publish but I also have made books of just images. There's, a, there's an essay in design theory I'm revisiting called Designer as Author by Michael Rock. Uh, it was often misunderstood to mean that designers should, should write or should be authors, which prompted him to make a follow-up essay called Fuck Content. Uh, so yes, I'm interested in the charisma embedded in the technology of writing and it's, aesthetic implications. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Alberto. Hi, um, thank you. Um, I'm, yeah, my name's Alberto. I'm currently based in Berlin. Um, highly fascinated with, with this seminar. And I really don't even know where to start, I think. But um, um, I'm personally, I'm I'm interested in kind of dismantling the experiences where I I felt the charismatic like operating on me. Mm. Um, so kind of unsettling kind of the technologies and designs of the charismatics. I was kind of interested in what now Nikki's was also saying and Jean Jacques before, like this kind of design of the charismatic um, technology or of its operation. I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Venezuela, so I grew up um, under the, the spectacle of revolution and of Chavez. So of course that's something I've had to deal with. So kind of interested in, in I don't know, sense reversing moments where I've had to engage with this kind of, uh, and, um, also kind of very interested how kind of the social sciences have built this archive also of, of secularizing the notion of the charisma, but have kind of failed at, at its attempt exactly. by just kind of distributing the, like the theological to other spheres. So this kind of, yeah, I think I would be interested in, in making notes that kind of uh, work this kind of scenography or like climatology of charisma kind of failing there and kind of bringing it to its, its success. I, I would be kind of, if I do that, wow, I'm very happy with, with, what, <laughs> what my, with myself. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that would be great. Thank you so much. Very good. Uh, yeah, even if you, if you just do a little bit, a small fragment of that, it'll be great. Um, Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Catherine? Hi, um, I'm Catherine. I'm based in New York. I work in the arts as a researcher and then also on curatorial projects. Um, and I have mostly been focusing on, I guess, new media, but um, I was really drawn to this class as a way to look into um, more back at the image. Um, and I think that um, through the course, I want to look specifically at forms of kind of horizonless images or images that don't use perspective, thinking of that as a maybe a form of plenitude as a way of blurring figure and ground and just kind of um, potentially like creating an, ap an atmosphere that's internal to a work. And, and I'm thinking of a few possibilities. One is like the, you know, in certain classical Asian traditions of art, you know, there's the use of, of pictorial scrolls and there's not really um, a perspectival use of um, 
of that of the picture and it's what you might call like axonometric there's no um, vanishing point and I'm so, so I'm kind of interested in pursuing this also in maybe other forms of um, image making and just sort of seeing where this goes one other connection I was thinking of in relation to the readings was of course the Berger text talks about how um, the, the Bosch doesn't really have a horizon and then also there's this emphasis too on like night as the loss of horizon in the Pisanic text. So I'm kind of going to try to uh, draw these together. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I, I just ha I have to uh, inject here that this is one of the things that I, I think Berger is wrong about. There is a horizon in Bosch. If you look at the painting very closely, you will see there is a horizon. So he kind of, he, uh, I love that piece by Berger, but there he just kind of, you know, skimmed too fast. He didn't look too closely. He, he was diagnosing the painting and the society really amazingly, but he, he didn't focus on those details. So the horizon in Bosch is there. Uh, that, that said, the horizonless image that you have in mind is an amazing topic. So that's awesome. I'm happy about that. Dana. Hello. Hi. Hi, if you can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. So I uh, live and I'm based in Saudi Arabia. Um, I work as a researcher within the public and uh, cultural sectors. A lot of the research varies from cultural politics to anthropology and, and uh, even goes into local ethnographies within art and curatorial perspectives, and then some personal research within both heritage and future studies. Um, when it comes to the charismatic image, I think it would be, it's very interesting to look into sorcery and, and, and magic, as everyone was saying, um, but I think I'm curious about perhaps the haunting image or images of horror or, or, or grotesque, uh, grotesque forms and, and the auras and atmospheric elements tied to them and perhaps in what climates do spectral images form and, and their metaphysical reactions and, and emanations there. Um, so just around that realm of, of something a bit more on the darker side, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, the spectral, the phantomal as I call it, uh, even more so. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Sasha? Hi there. Um, Hi. I am an architect based in Seattle, Washington, and um, I'm very outside the realm of uh, academia and feel a little out of my element, don't have any um, education in philosophy or art theory. Um, but I was really drawn to the description of, um, of this course. And initially, when I, when I hear the word charisma, um, I'm very, it evokes like a skepticism in me. I think about encountering, um, you know, people with with charisma or um, objects, and and it does um, evoke this sort of skepticism that there is maybe an, an underlying um, manipulation that I'm very um, curious about. And then just with my architecture ba background, I'm very interested in what is what is the charisma. Um, of space, how does um, the materiality of, of architecture get imbued with um, charisma? Great, thank you. Uh, one, thing, one example that comes to my mind immediately uh, for me would be uh, Diller and Scofidio's building uh, pavilion, they call blur building. A yeah, blur building in Switzerland. They made that pavilion uh, because of the ephemeral spectral nature of, of it. Just throwing some architecture at you there. Uh, thank you. Um, Matthew? Hey, can you hear me? Yep, 
hear you well. Hey, yeah, um, I am currently, I guess since uh, since Octavia Butler was mentioned, I'm basically where Acorn is in Parable of the Sower. Um, but in general, I'm based in LA and New Orleans. Um, and I guess I came to this course, I, I have a lot of interest in rupture and glitch and collapse. And um, strangely, Dayan actually used to, didn't attend read, but used to take some of your classes and do the reading work through them through uh, Creighton Weidner. I don't know if you remember him of as one of your students. Of course I remember him. Of yeah, course. so I lived with Creighton and then moved to Texas with him for years. So I actually oh, have that goodness. huge Carpe okay. Curricula PDF. And uh, oh, we used to uh, have some very interesting discussions based around some of your classes back then and saw your name here. And the charismatic image doesn't necessarily apply exactly <laughs> to that. I, I do believe that a lot of a lot of a, a lot of pieces of rupture happened within charisma and especially within charismatic images in so far as they're sort of expressions of unforeseen unpredictable free will etc and just thought this would be an interesting course to take wow wow great to have you here and and create some spirit as well yeah thank you matthew um who didn't Peak. Jill? Hello. Hi. Can you see me? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Jill. I'm uh, based in Berlin and um, I come from like uh, design media arts and I was drawn to this class um, for the reason that I um, researched and wrote my thesis about sort of um, the opposite of like aesthetics, you could kind of say, about like um, CMI's minor aesthetic categories that are like very trivial and concomitant. Okay. And um, they like aren't linked to like um, reasoning um, or yeah, so, and uh, connected that with social media and when I saw this class I exactly for that reason wanted to like um, expand my knowledge or like investigation on aesthetic theory and go to like the charismatic image and also think about um, charisma and the effects mm. that are like can be caused by it um, and yeah that's it. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I took a class that I really loved as a graduate student called The Ordinary. Um, and it was on the mundane. And here I am now talking about the opposite, but I feel like somewhere they connect to. Thank you, Jill. Nadia? Uh, hey, I am a poet and a social justice advocate. I'm currently based in Chicago. Um, and I was interested in taking this class because, well, like some of my main like interests or research interests are like narratology and psycholinguistics and affect theory mm -hmm. um and also just like avant-garde art in general um so i was thinking about um charisma in a couple ways one like i save a lot of images just because they have some kind of again like charisma or magnetic magnetic thing about them also just makes you think of like creating a narrative about them some some kind of like a crisis or drastic thing um, and then I was also thinking about like different movements that really draw me in, be it like Andy Warhol's factory or like happenings um, and things like that. And like, I just kind of want to like explore mm -hmm. what is in that aura. Um, and then also think about it, like certain images that like have it, like a hint of a narrative going with them. That's like not necessarily related to the context. So just like expanding on that. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Yes, affect theory is highly relevant for all of this. That is to say, affects, if I said, you know, art is about unforeseen sensations, basically I'm saying it's run through affects or it's embedded in desire. Um, and naturally I'm also influenced by many avant-garde movements and I'm, I, I, I still think they are extremely relevant uh, for critical thinking, if you will, even though most of them have been dismissed. Uh, but uh, in any case, we'll come back to that. Very good. Agatha, Agatha. 
Uh, hi, <clears throat> I'm a painter and I live in Poland and it's a bit funny, but sometimes I use this sentence that you mentioned that uh, the bio biodiversity uh, is uh, the highest value in my artist statement uh -huh. to make it uh, sound more sophisticated. <laughs> So I thought uh, maybe I could dwell on that and um, look um, uh, look for charis charisma or charismatic image among the depiction of animals because in fact this is the topic of my paintings. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, excellent. Okay. Did I miss anyone else? Uh, yeah, I can quickly introduce myself. Oh, Hello. Uh, my name is Alexei from Minsk, Alexei. Belarus. Um, there is a lot of, of things to digest after this lecture, but what stayed with me is the sort of when you introduced first charisma as a gift from Holy Spirit, I was thinking about charisma as a monstrous feature because I do a lot of monstrosity studies and I was thinking about charisma and as something that has an ability to inform and enable swarms, swarms mm -hmm. of monsters maybe in this kind of provoke uh, the self-organization or turning people into fanatics or this kind of stuff. Um, and it's definitely a powerful feature. So I see why would church uh, claim monopoly over this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that I will be working in this direction, but uh, I will need to think about it more. Thank, thank you. Sure, sounds great. Uh, there is a specific term, I don't know if you guys know about the study of monsters, it's, it's teratology, teratology. Uh, this was supposedly scientific uh, discipline. Uh, and I'm, you know, obviously very interested in, in that as well. Uh, I am attempting to turn that around as well and, and see it as a positive or affirmative uh, <laughs> uh, alignment. But anyway, it's a cool word, teratology. Very good. Wow, you are also interesting. I don't know if you took classes together before um, or you know each other, but now you know, you, you know, it's a big group. You know each other a little bit. Um, and it's great to, to hear uh, your voice and, you know, your geography. So I'll send an email for the for with just basic instructions for next week. Thank you for being patient. We went way over time. I don't think we will do that next time. You know, we'll be more focused uh, on specific works. Um, what else can I say? There's 122 chat messages, which I will not read. Um, but I'm happy you are, you know, engaging <laughs> with each other there. Thank you, Jonathan, for running this smoothly. Um, have a great rest of the Sunday, and I will see you next weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.